how should you cross-examine a witness in court? Two subscribers, Daniel Arif Tung and Dashini Tyagarajan asked for a video on cross-examination. Thank you for your support. As a reward, here it is. How should you cross-examine a witness? Now, cross-examination is an art. There is too little time to explain everything here. But first, let us look at some essentials. Here's the scene. John, the plaintiff, is the defendant's employee. John is your client. On the 23rd of June 2017, at 8.35 p.m., while John was inspecting a pipeline in the defendant's premises, a tank exploded. John, your client, was very badly injured. Now, you want to show that the disaster could have been easily avoided had the defendant followed safety precautions. The employer has not. The defendant, the employer says in his defense, yes, it's a terrible thing that's occurred, but I am not at fault. So, how should you deal with any witness, an opposing witness? Put questions to the witness in simple words, in short sentences. Be exceedingly clear, be exceedingly polite, get on his side, bring down his natural inclination to distrust you. Before we go any further, let's look at some do's and don'ts. Some do's. Have a list or a roadmap for cross-examination. The roadmap must have milestones that say to prove A, to prove B, etc. In each milestone, describe what objective you wish to achieve. Your chapter on defendant's liability may, for example, note show defendant was responsible for plaintiff's injury, sole reason was gas explosion, defendant wholly responsible, no other cause. Those are your milestones. Each of these milestones must point in the right direction to victory to show that the defendant was completely, solely and wholly responsible. Keep it tight and keep it short. Don't ramble. A cross-examination question should not exceed 10 to 12 words, mostly about 8. It must, if you can manage it, produce a yes or no answer. Unless you want a designated answer, a yes or no answer may be avoided, but that will be demonstrated later, but that's rare. Fence your witness in. It's called corralling the witness. You remember the movie? Noon at OK Corral? Corral means a fence. If you cannot control the witness, you are lost in the wilderness. Some don'ts. Never ask an open-ended question. Never ask. So what do you think of the answer given by Mr. Mark M? That is an invitation to places that you don't want to go. If you don't know the answer to the question, for goodness sake, don't ask it. So how do you think the tank exploded? Is an invitation to a trips about the woods in total darkness. Contrast that with this question. Don't you think it was all the defendant's fault that the plaintiff was injured? Is still dangerously open-ended. Draw out the truth. Don't try to make your witness look stupid. He would resist you with all his might. Next, do not hurry. Be clinical, be clipped, but do not rush. Know when to slow down. And remember, the judge is writing. Speak only when the judge's pen stops moving or the judge nods towards you. Cajole the witness. Lead the witness one millimeter at a time. Then let him step over the cliff all by himself. Don't try to push him. He won't like it. Look at this example. John is the plaintiff, as you recall. You are cross-examining one of his supervisors, Mr. Smith. Question. The tank exploded on the 23rd of June 2017 at 8.35 p.m., didn't it? Answer. Yes. Question. The defendant company owned and operated the gas tank? Yes. The tank was situated in the defendant's premises? Yes. At the time the tank exploded, was John working near the tank? 
Answer, yes. John was inspecting the gas pipe, was he not? Answer, yes. Did John's duties require him to work near the tank? Yes, all the time. Yes, of course. Was John the only one working near the tank when it exploded? Yes. You are a qualified petroleum engineer, aren't you? Yes, sir. Is it not true that too much inflammable gas was being pumped into the tank at that time? Yes. Just before the explosion, the tank's pressure had exceeded the safety limit? Yes. That was the only reason the tank had exploded? Yes. Yes. The force of the explosion tore off John's right foot, didn't it? I am not sure, he says. It's dithering. So go over areas which are familiar to him, which are not threatening to him. John's injuries are consistent with a gas tank explosion, aren't they? Yes. There was no other reason other than the explosion for John's injury was there. I'm not sure, the witness says. He is being evasive, even defensive. But you'd expect that. Question. Five minutes before the explosion, you had given him some instructions? Yes, I did. You, in fact, directed him to close the pressure valves? Yes. That would mean the pressure cannot be released and had to be built up? Yes. Then you turned off to answer a phone call, didn't you? Yes. And the phone call was a private one, was it not? Answer, yes. My wife called to tell me about a party that we had to attend during the weekend. Now, don't push him on that subject too much. Him over it. Reserve the unofficial phone call at the crucial moment that distracted him for arguments later on. In Malaysia, we call it submission. After the explosion, you rushed to John? Answer, yes. You were the first to reach him, weren't you? Yes. Why did you rush to him? Now, this is contrary to the rule against open-ended questions. But he has limited answers and any answer that he's going to give you will be useful. His answer is, John appeared to be in a bad way. He's being deliberately vague. In fact, he was lying 30 meters from the tank, was he not? Yes. In a mass of blood and tissue? Yes. And he was missing a foot? Yes. At this point, if you say it was all the defendant company's fault, wasn't it? He is the company's witness and he would fight you to the death. Or he would say, I disagree. So, here are a few words on technical gobbledygook. If you ask him why he disagreed to your question, he will give you 45 minutes of technical engineering gobbledygook. Don't ever go there. You are not qualified to understand what he is saying. Unless you have read up reams and reams of technical stuff, which you probably haven't done, don't stray there and don't get your foot cut off. So press on carefully, edging him closer and closer to the cliff until he leaps off it. But don't wander too far. Be clipped. Be precise. Be clinical. Things in order of time. Be logical. So here's the question. Was an investigation carried out to determine what had been the cause of the explosion? Answer, yes. You were part of that investigating team, weren't you? Yes. Now, the investigating team's report says that the pressure in the tank shortly before the explosion was three times above the safety limit, does it not? Yes. Look at the tone of his voice. He didn't say yes. He said yes. And that was a tank that had exploded? Yes. Which department is in charge of controlling and maintaining the pressure in the tank? He will give you a circuitous answer because he thinks you're going to blame the defendant, which is what you intend to do. Again, he will give you technical gobbledygook. He will attempt to show that somehow the company was not at fault. Let him ramble on a bit. Don't cut in. Wait. Then politely get in there, press on and say, question. Sir, I asked 
which department was in charge? Answer that question, please. The engineering department. Was it the department in which John worked? Answer, no. John was in the maintenance department. Question, was the engineering department directly under the defendant's company? Yes, it was. Question, you have to lead him to the edge. You have consistently told the court, have you not, over the last 45 minutes, that the engineering department was in charge. Hadn't you? I did, but he will assign other causes for the injury and for the explosion. Be careful. But now is the right time. Push him over the brink gently. Question. And had the defendant's engineering department done its job and then pause. You're not saying the engineering department. You're saying the defendant's engineering department. Pause. He will blink like a deer caught in the headlights of a car deep in the forest in a dark sunlight. He will try to disagree. But let him, in an unhurried tone, ask, had the defendant's engineering department ensured the safety of the tank? Then pause, look at him dead in the eyes, swivel your eyes to the judge, turn your eyes and gaze back to the witness, hold it there and shuffle some papers for about three seconds. Then pop the question firmly, logically, unhurriedly. The defendant would not have lost his leg and his livelihood. I don't know, is the answer. What and who do you think the trial judge will believe? Draw out the truth, lead the witness one millimeter at a time. Don't go all over the place. Be very careful in the direction of your questions. Let the witness do your work for you. That is the trick. Now, here is a suggestion. If you can, get hold of John Hostetler's book, Thomas Erskine and Trial by Jury. Thomas Erskine was a cross-examiner who could draw what he wanted out of any witness. One judge reported that he could bewitch the trial judge and bring the witness completely under his spell. You can do it too. It requires some practice and hours and hours of homework and rehearsing in front of the mirror, asking the questions in the right order. But it can be done. Why don't you try it? Thank you. Subscribe, ring that bell and slam that thumbs up sign. See you again soon in another episode of GKTV Law. Goodbye.